You doing all right today, MG? Where's Reese? What's he up to? He's concerned about the virus, so he's washing his hands. Okay, you know, I'm not even going to ask. Hello, Minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. So, a bit of a different thing for me today. I'm doing a floral. Our azaleas are blooming, and uh, they're looking pretty nice up by the porch. So, I've decided to put some azaleas in my spiral notebook here. And as a little bit of extra viewing footage, I'm also going to give you a brief tour of this book. Because pretty brief because I haven't gotten very far into it. The interesting thing about this, this is a cheap Joe's uh, spiral bound journal. It's Kilimanjaro paper interspersed with sketchbook paper. Kilimanjaro is very good cotton paper. There's a video on everything in here. So I'm not only going to show you the pieces that I've done in here and you, a lot of you probably seen the videos, but I'm also going to list the videos down in the description. So you can go back and look at those videos you want and there might be a few that you missed that you haven't seen. So in this video, I'm doing a lot of negative painting. Let's watch the video. All right, so this is what I'm going to be painting in today, and I'll give you a little bit of a tour. Uh, this is a really nice book. This is a spiral journal, spiral bound watercolor paper journal made by uh, Cheap Joes, or made for Cheap Joes. It's a 100% cotton cold press. 140 pound. I've never done anything but with this cover page. It's got a little really heavy cardstock cover pages you can paint and then you can tear off the uh, cover that came with it. I've just never done that. I, I think it's a unique thing is these uh, sketch paper sheets that are in between each page. And I use this sketchbook kind of as a nature journal, uh, nature study journal. Every one of these pages, by the way, is a video. In case there's a video that you've missed, uh, this actually is two videos. It's actually three, that's a patron video. So there's actually three videos here. I did that for patrons, I did that as a plein air, and I did that as a studio painting. This is a good one for showing how to use masking fluid on a detailed subject. Yeah, I, I really do love this paper. It lifts a little easier than arches. Nobody knows for sure. Well, I'm sure Cheap Joe's knows, but I've tried to find out who makes the paper for them. Cheap Joe's doesn't make their own paper. Uh, I believe it comes from an English mill, like Blix uh, house brand, which leads me to believe it might be a St. Cuthbert's paper, like Saunders Waterford, but I don't know for sure. The texture is very similar to Saunders Waterford, so it would not surprise me if St. Cuthbert's makes this paper for Cheap Joe's. Anyway, if you've ever wanted to try Kilimanjaro, I heartily recommend it. Then there's this. This was a negative painting episode, and there's a video for this. I think maybe there's a video, might be a video for one of them, and one of them was for patrons. I forget exactly, but uh, dogwood, maple, and was a great exercise in negative painting. Really, really enjoyed that one. Well, I enjoy them all, but I especially enjoyed that because it turned out uh, better than I expected. And sometimes I'll use these interspersed things to do a little sketch study. This was a pen and ink of a camellia. I did a video on this. And this was one where, uh, I think during October, where I showed how you could carry most of the line and the tone with ink, pen and ink, and just use a very, very slight amount of color. I mean, I probably spent five minutes coloring that, maybe ten. Most of the work was done in pen and ink but very, very enjoyable piece. So yeah, watch that video. You may or may not have seen this video. This was four branch studies. And I love to do this in the winter uh, before spring uh, takes over some of these branch structures. They just make really interesting designs. And I wanna do some more of this because uh, there are just so many out there uh, that just look neat. I look at branch structures all the time and they're very fascinating. So yeah, watch that video. And here was a little marker study on the sketchbook paper uh, where I was going to do these rock studies. So yep, another video for that. If you want to look at uh, doing rock studies. Now here I was just testing some pens, um, but this is another one. Uh, this was line and wash, but in this case, uh, the watercolor carried more of the tone in the shading versus the line. So I used the line mostly as outlines and a little bit of detail and let uh, watercolor carry most of the rest of it. This was a spring. I might have done this last year at spring. 
uh, these were emerging forms of right about this time of year where the forms were just starting to come out. The dogwood and the red maple, both from my yard. That's a video you can watch. This is a ballpoint pen landscape sketch that I never have done. Uh, I still have an idea for that and I have some photo reference, but need to do that one. Uh, just uh, a little study in the undulation of hills. It's very much like studying wrinkles on a human being or wrinkles in cloth. Um, but sometimes it's, it's fun just to pick a particular aspect of a subject and study it. And that's what I did here. And yep, there's a video for that one. So this was a video. That was really fun. Um, very loose. Uh, this is very similar to the camellia in that the line work carried most of the shading and detail. And that the paint was primarily just splashed in loosely. I did mind where the highlights were and lift that up, but if you haven't seen that video, again, that will be in the list in the description. You can go watch that video. This was, when did I do this? Right before Christmas or right after Christmas? Anyway, it was recent. This was the most recent. This was a Patreon video where I was just going back over and recapping a video I actually did uh, years ago, back when the channel was new on doing winter trees, especially distant ones, and how that very fine brush texture can be gotten with a uh, dry brush. So if you're a patron, you can go see that. This one, I believe, was done on YouTube. Just a nice little study uh, in blues and grays of a winter tree line. And that brings us up to today, but I'll save that reveal for the end. So let's get started on the azaleas. Well, I already have a drawing done that I spent a little bit of time on. didn't want to waste too much time showing that. So I'm lightening that up so that I can go in with some watercolor pencil. And I'll show you that in a minute. I have several uh, reference photos here that I'm using. I'm really going to be fairly inventive with these blooms and just use these as character reference, characteristic reference. So I won't be copying any one flower. And what I'm doing is uh, a bit of an underpainting, actually. I want to be able to see this over the loose washes, or under the loose washes. So I'm using this Albert Durer, sort of a dark pink watercolor pencil here. And I'm going to kind of turn that into a, a underpainting that can be seen through washes. This really has no other purpose than just as a guide. And it'll become clear in a, in a few minutes why I did that. But when you do um, negative painting and loose washes, uh, you still need a fairly tight guide to show through those washes. Even if the, the I, at least I think so, in the style I do it. Even if the painting is going to be fairly loose. And this ended up being tighter than I anticipated. Uh, at least the blooms did, I, and that's fine. I, I wanted this to just go whichever way it ended up going. And a lot of times I let the art determine for me, you know, what's going to work best. So uh, I just lined these guys in, and then I, I pulled out the shading, you know, towards uh, where the shadows would be. And I was just hoping it would be dark enough to show through. Uh, the loose washes I put on top. And I'm doing the same thing with uh, some of the background leaves. And I'm, I'm placing these leaves very randomly. I'm, uh, I'm just using, again, the reference that I have as a characteristic reference, meaning here's what a typical leaf looks like. Here's how they curl, here's how they shade and shadow, and and then using those characteristics to invent my own shapes, shadows, and placement. Again, just pulling the watercolor pencil pigment out into a shadowy area. And I think you can see now how this all just kind of works as an under painting. 
I decided to use uh, my Mission Gold palette, and I haven't used this in a while. This is the tube paint, and it's the Pure Pigment set. Now, I did a review of this set. This is a massive palette, which is why I don't reach for it a lot, because it takes up a lot of real estate. I actually really love the paint, and I'm going to start using it more, I think, because it's just great paint. I picked it, though, because of the reds. It's got a really robust reds palette. It's really got too many reds. In their Pure Pigment set, they have this sort of squirrely kind of system for setting up the palette. And I set up my palette exactly the way they demonstrated, just for the purposes of the review. And again, I will put that link below. But they had uh, the 24 Pure Pigment colors, and then they had um, you expanding that to 54 by combining colors in the wells. And this is their biggest palette. I wanted to see how the system worked. It's okay. I think it's overwhelming, a little bit difficult to use. I would not do it. I would just put out the 24 colors and do all mixing on the palette. Um, but it's an interesting system, and they have a whole brochure. I don't know if they even do that anymore. You can still buy the Pure Pigment set, but if you do and they still have that, that palette set up, I don't recommend it. It's not necessary. But regardless, it's great paint. So... I am just brushing in some pink where those blossoms are going to be. And then we're going to spread this pigment all over the paper. When you're setting up for negative painting, usually your first washes are, are big, washy, don't adhere to any boundaries. They just go everywhere. Because you come back and define later with negative paint around them. And there's a lot of ways you can spread this pigment. I used uh, a spray. Another way would be just to put down the pigment and then blend it out with a brush. You'd have more control about which areas it went to. I wanted it to look a little more spontaneous. Uh, another way would be to completely pre-wet the paper. That would work great. I've actually thought about doing that, but I thought, well, I'm going to try the spray because I want to direct it. Uh, in very flowy ways in particular directions. So I decided to use spray. I didn't want to completely cover the paper in the pink. Uh, it's going to peek out from behind the green when I start negative painting, but I only wanted to do that in places, in expressive kind of loose ways. So you'll see. So as the pigment flows and the water flows, and I'm just dabbing it, this is a great way, and it looks quite different than just like if I painted in the blooms with sort of solid washes. This is a great, great way to add a lot of variegation and interest in the washes, the way the washes will kind of play. So I'm putting in different temperatures of red, Another reason I chose this palette, because there were several different reds. Right down to purples, right on up to some red oranges. Just so all the hues could mix and play. And usually when you're doing this, and again, setting up for a negative painting, you're painting the light middle value. Later on you're going to go in and you're going to add deeper shadows. But you can see how that those pink washes dried much lighter. Your typical watercolor drying shift. And so uh, with that dry, and yes, the paper is completely dry, and I'm going in with the negative painting. Now you can do this fairly loose, at least on the outer edges, but around the blooms it needed to be fairly tight and distinct to define where they are. Here I'm just using the Sterling Edwards blending and glazing brush because I wanted to blend it out but uh, I'm painting very distinctly around those blooms and again we're in a fairly middle value and I can barely see them but I can see those leaf shapes that I put in with watercolor pencil so just I'll work my way around um, doing some blends in places I have the, the leaves show distinctly and they don't blend out softly so I'm getting sort of a mix of that effect you 
but you can see how I, I do that work around and the pink uh, you can kind of see uh, is sort of unifying the whole thing the looseness and what you do usually in a negative painting especially where leaves and botanical blooms and that sort of thing is that you go back you keep going back in value and pushing back those negative forms so I'm going a little cooler with the green a little darker to bring some of those more front oriented leaves forward and push others back and I'll do about three layers of this kind of negative painting and here I'm just I'm going in and popping in some darker contrast in corners I'm adding a little bit of shading facet value if you will to uh, some of the leaves to give them some shape divide where that center crease goes on some of them I, but I'm not going to get real detailed with these leaves most of the detail is going to end up being in the blooms and here you're seeing me go back yet another level in value most of those areas are smaller now just little corners of deep recesses which is great uh, not only to give the whole those leaves dimension but to you know add some nice contrast and now you can see the blooms are just kinda starting to pop off the page now we're gonna start working on them and here uh, we're not really negative painting anymore as much as we are modeling the light on the petals and I'm using pretty much a sculptural light not a directional light meaning that I just separate separate the petals give enough shadow to pull them apart to go down into that little funnel area that the blooms have and just work down into those darker values using about three reds here sort of a fire engine red um, down to a purple and sort of a I don't know I, I'm not familiar with the names on this palette enough because I don't use them enough but um, it's a very warm to a cool progression of about three or four reds Azalea blooms are fairly complex. They got a lot of ruffles on the edges. And these blooms are big for azaleas. You'll get with azaleas, you get all different size blooms out there. Here I'm uh, just on one edge, on a few edges actually, here on this bloom, and then I'll do it on some leaves. I'm lifting out some highlights, as I will in some of the places on the leaves and I decided to really detail only a few leaves and even those are not highly detailed just sort of still impressionistic I guess stylized most of the detail will stay in the blooms I'm not really much of a floral painter uh, I, I really admire good floral painting um, but these azaleas have special meaning it's a tradition every spring we look forward to them and we have quite a few shrubs out there and they all sort of bloom at different times and all the blooms look different so in this uh, journal which I showed you um, I like documenting you know something that is in our yard and makes uh, means something to me and we'll go through the same process on this bloom. Painting blooms successfully, especially ones that have very undulated edges and petals, uh, just requires a lot of observation. There's no tricks. It's just looking at the light and shadow and how the forms curve and wave and undulate.
these blooms in reality were much uh, more red. I, I wanted to kind of push it back towards the pink a little bit. Uh, just I think I get a little more light modeling flexibility that way. Um, rendering red in watercolor, a very deep, vivid red, it's hard to do. You can do it, but um, I really just kind of wanted to keep them a little bit lighter so they stand out also against that background. This is sort of the finishing touch. This is gouache and I'm just popping in the stamens. This is Holbein gouache. I didn't put it out fresh. That's the best way to get sort of uh, opacity, I guess you might say. And it is pink. I, I mixed a pink. It's not pure white. It's kind of hard to tell over that deeper, darker pink. Um, but uh, sometimes you have to go over these several times till you get the opacity you want. Well, gouache almost always dries darker unless you put it on thick and heavy. Once I got it where I wanted it, then I just added a dark sort of underlying shadow of, of purple. It's sort of a dark pink purple. Now they're really, you can see I've, I've finished the one on the left. Now they're really looking like azalea blooms. I added a little more contrast too with the, the light dark sort of lining than in reality to get them to stand out a little more. So some final little touches here and we're just about done and there it is. All done. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Thanks everybody for watching. Appreciate it. Thank you so much patrons for your support and we'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.